And now we're going to go through each kind of individually. OK. So the ACAP, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, has some guidelines for treatment of bipolar in children. They also have, not the ACAP, but the APA, which is the uh, the big organization of psychiatry has guidelines for the treatment of bipolar in adults. Now, the idea is to have monotherapy, but monotherapy means only one medication. Which medication to choose, and hopefully that just one medication is going to work, right? But remember, we talk about comorbidity. So if we're talking about comorbidity, and it's a high rate of comorbidity, then it's very unlikely that we're only going to be able to use one medication. We can use one medication to regulate mood, but if we have ADHD going on, the mood regulator or the mood stabilizer is not going to help with the ADHD, so we have to address that. If the anxiety is apart from the bipolar disorder, then we have to address the anxiety. So again, there's all that dilemma where we have to kind of concentrate on the main symptom and then from there tease out all the other ones that are important. So we have antipsychotics. Um, antipsychotics are for what they call psychosis, auditory visual hallucinations, any type of hallucinations, disorganization of the thought process, as well as um, delusions like paranoia. Okay? But antipsychotics are not used only for those things. They're used in aggression, and they're used as mood stabilizers. In other words, to stabilize mood. Okay? So we can use antipsychotics as monotherapy, or begin with an antipsychotic. And again, we'll get to that specifically. Then we have the mood stabilizers. Neurologists use them as seizure medications. We use them as, um, we call them mood stabilizers. A lot of parents will go, well, why they put them on a seizure medication if they have a mood disorder? Well, because we use them, again, as mood stabilizers. Trileptal, lamictal, um, tegretol, uh, those are the mood stabilizers. Now, lithium is not a seizure medication, but it is a mood stabilizer, okay? And Depakote, um, that is a seizure medication. And then we have antidepressants. Now, that's a whole other talk that we're going to go really quickly through, but antidepressants can be used in bipolar disorder. Okay? They're not contraindicated. Contra you just can't start someone as a, uh, on an antidepressant with bipolar disorder because it's very likely to make them worse. That does not mean you cannot use antidepressants later on when you have the foundation. And those are the terms we're going to talk about is in how to build the foundation of medication in a mood disorder. Um, usually, it takes a while, you know, for a parent, 12, anything past a week is a long time. Anything past 24 hours is a long time when you're dealing with a child with severe mood swings. It could take a year, it could take two years, it can take three years to really get the mix of medications that's going to help this child, okay? Once you have that mix of medication, then they have a growth spurt. What happens? Now you have to adjust the medication. They just had a breakup with a girlfriend. Then there's a stressor there. Then you have to adjust medication also, right? So there's a lot. Their metabolism changes. Um, they just got their menses for the first time. Metabolism is slowing down. Their testosterone levels are higher. So in kids, there is not the medication at this dose that works. It doesn't exist. It's a constant move of medications, depending on what's going on and what the need is. Very different than in adults. I believe an adult is much easier to treat than a child is because of all these factors you have to take into account. Okay. Um, usually there's an 80 to 90% relapse, even with meds. Because, again, what do you call, what, you know, you really don't know what the cycle is. You might feel like, wow, they've gotten much better on this medication. Well, maybe they're on that positive end of the cycle. You know, you discharge them, they do great for two weeks, and then they crash again. Is it because, is it because they were in that part of the cycle that was just positive, right? And they were in the up, up slope? Or is it because the medication really didn't work, did, um, did work for a while, and then it stopped working? Time will tell. You get to know your patients. We've had patients here that started when they were five years old, and now, you know, you know, 10 years later, and then you, have, then you really get an idea of what's going on and how they cycle and what triggers them, and, and, um, and, and it's easier to treat. The, the symptoms are easier to treat. 
Okay, pre-treatment workup, just to go quickly. Um, again, we talked about the differential diagnosis, so we do need to get labs. Why do we need to get labs? We need to make sure that their thyroid is fine, they're not anemic. Because of the medications we are using, that can change and affect some the liver, some renal function, right? Can affect the white blood count. We need to get a baseline. So if you're treating any child with an antipsychotic or a mood stabilizer, or an antidepressant, you need baseline labs, okay? Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The only medications you don't really, the only medications you don't need baseline labs for are the stimulants for ADHD. Besides that, all the other ones. Now, does that mean you have to get the labs that same day? No, I mean, you can give them a week, give them two weeks, make some rapport so the child doesn't think that, you know, that's what you are here for is to do that kind of stuff. And EKG, we will talk about the meds and notice that antipsychotics can, make, can give you EKG changes, right? They can affect the rhythm of the heart. So you wanna have a baseline EKG also, okay? If you're, getting, if you're using antipsychotics, not necessarily for antidepressants and not for mood stabilizers, okay? When do you get an EEG? That is not part of the workup. That is only if you're suspecting seizure disorder. Okay, would you get an EEG? Um, and again, the word is monotherapy. We would like to treat kids with just one medication. Highly unlikely, okay? But that's the goal. Okay, neuroleptics or antipsychotics. We talked about antipsychotics are the medications that work on the dopamine system, and what they do is they treat psychosis. They treat hallucinations, delusions, disorganized thought. We use them in aggression. We use them in aggression in autism. It doesn't cure autism, but it, it helps with the aggression in autism. And we use them as mood stabilizers. Antipsychotics are ever-changing. There are much better ones, much newer ones, and newer and better means that they try to limit the side effects to the antipsychotics, the ones that they can cause, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that the ones that have some important side effects are not good ones. Uh, for example, Risperdal. These are the newer generation ones, um, and as from top to bottom of the newer meds, Risperdal is maybe the oldest one, and then you go down to Safras, which is kind of the newer ones that we use in the kids. Most of these are not FDA approved. We use them because we take steps, and, uh, and we start with the ones that there is more research on, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we move on, okay? Always having a lot of caution for side effects and making sure, at this point of the treatment, sure, we want efficacy, but we need to make sure that if there are, we can't guarantee that there's not gonna be any side effects. We don't know until the medication is tried, but it's our responsibility as physicians to catch them in time, okay, and to be able to identify them, because we don't want this side effect to continue and continue and cause permanent damage of any sort. Okay, so we have these antipsychotics. Why do we use them as a first-line treatment? If you look at the algorithms or the recommendations, you're gonna see that part of the recommendations are not using only the antipsychotics, it's using the mood stabilizers as first-line treatment. But with kids, usually when you're starting medications, it's usually it's an emergency. They're already, and, and when I, I say a, a relative emergency, they're, they're already becoming aggressive. They've already had tons of ISS. They're going to be suspended or going to alternative school. So it is an emergency, right? So we want a medication that, and I'm gonna use these terms, that's going to kick in quickly, that's going to work and give us a good response quicker, okay? The antipsychotics will do that. The mood stabilizers have to build up in the system along for a period of time before they actually work, okay? But they have less potential side effects than the antipsychotics. So again, we use one because it works quicker, right? While we can use the other one and bring it on, which is the mood stabilizer, which is the one we're gonna use for a long term if it's effective enough to use as monotherapy. Did that make sense? because that's really important when we start, you know, we're building the foundation. So antipsychotic first because it works fast. Brings down the aggression. It's kind of the break, instant break, okay? 
Let's go back and talk about a little bit. We'll go real quick. Okay, Risperdal. Risperdal is an antipsychotic. It comes in various forms. Remember when we're talking about little kids, they don't always know how to swallow. So we need medications that come in different forms. We need medications that come in liquid. We need medications that come in shots. And we need medications that come in dissolvable tablets. Risperdal comes in dissolvable tablets. It works quickly, okay? Most of these antipsychotics increase the appetite, okay? Slow down the metabolism. When you slow down the metabolism, you can cause something called metabolic syndrome. This is very important. This is why you get labs and why you have to kind of check up on this child very closely because metabolic syndrome, when you slow down metabolism, your glucose increases. When your glucose increases, you can bring out diabetes. If you have a high risk of diabetes in the family, and we live in San Antonio, which is the majority of us, someone has diabetes, then, then we have to make sure we don't induce this diabetes. If it's going to start happening, we need to be able to respond to it. We change the medication, we send them to an endocrinologist, we make sure things are going in the right direction. Obesity is another problem in our, in, our, um, in, in, our, in our city, right? In our society now, it's actually the whole nation. So a lot of these medications increase the appetite. And it's not appetite for vegetables and fruit, it's appetite for carbohydrates, right? Um, a little tidbit, when you are cycling in bipolar disorder, there's something about chocolate. Women that are PMSing like chocolate, kids that have bipolar disorder go after chocolate and sweets, right? And if you're on an antipsychotic, you go after chocolate and sweets, okay? So um, those things you have to be very careful with because again, you're, you're gonna increase, uh, increase weight and then brings along a lot of problems. When you slow down the metabolism, you can also increase triglycerides Right? as well as cholesterol. If you have a family history of having these problems, hyperlipidemia at an early age, you can bring it out. So again, you need to get labs baseline so you can check for it because if you have it already, you really need to consider what medication, if the child has it already, you have to really think about what medication you're gonna use, okay? Mm, other, the antipsychotics can cause a couple of other things. EPS, which is this response, it's kind of this muscle stiffness to the antipsychotics and they start kind of walking a little bit stiff. Or they will complain of neck pain or back pain, that kind of thing. You, there's a way of checking for it, it's called cogwheeling. You can actually feel like the muscle is spasming, right? Um, that is caused by the antipsychotic. It's treated in various ways. One, you, start the, you stop the antipsychotic. Uh, two, you can give Benadryl to treat it. Uh, but it has to be identified appropriately to be able to do that, okay? That can go along with drooling also. Okay. That's one of the signs. The other one is tardive dyskinesia. This is one that we don't see as kids, but you have to be very cautious because when you are, when a child is on an anti, when an individual is on an antipsychotic for a long period of time at a high dose, you can get tardive dyskinesia, abnormal muscle movements. Right? And, and that can occur, again, on a high dose of antipsychotic for a long period of time. So you have to pay attention to the dosing, the dosage of your medication. Now, you're always putting this on a balance, right? Because if this person becomes incredibly aggressive um, or suicidal and they've had multiple suicide attempts and, and they're difficult to treat but they respond to this medication at a high dose, you have to put it on a balance, right? You do what you can to prevent the tardive dyskinesia, but you can't just not treat them because you're fearful of all these side effects. So you have to watch for them, okay? When do these side effects present? Most of these side effects present within the first two weeks. Therefore, your first to follow up after each medication that is started should be within the first two weeks, okay? Now, they can present afterwards when you change meds, but usually the side effects occur within the first two weeks, except for tardive dyskinesia, which is chronic use, so it presents later on, and it's really unpredictable. Um, so those are the ones that when it, it has to do with concerning the lipids, uh, the, tri, the lipids and the glucose, you get a labs after the first month of starting and then three months and then six months after that, okay, to follow up. But you won't, that's not gonna be immediate change when, you, when the lipids um, become abnormal if they're going to or the glucose, okay? 
So then we have all these to go through, Risperdal. Uh, some of the side effects are used to benefit the child if they're having trouble sleeping. Remember, that can be one of the symptoms, right? Or if they tend to be underweight and they're not eating well, then they also increase the appetite. Risperdal definitely causes sedation, increases appetite. Uh, olanzapine significantly increases appetite. So that's the one that I kind of stay away from. It's an excellent medication when it comes to uh, defining it as an antipsychotic, but the side effects are significant with uh, Zyprexa, with uh, wet, uh, weight increase. Um, some kids have such a high metabolism that it doesn't even affect their weight or their appetite. They just, it just doesn't affect them. Their lipids are fine. And again, you will only know when you check. Seroquel is a commonly used one. It also causes a lot of sedation, so we use it to help with sleep at night. Uh, Geodon is one that actually does not affect appetite as much. All of them have that risk. Does not affect appetite as much, does not affect, uh, does not cause drowsiness as, much, drowsiness as much, but you have to take it with food because it does not absorb well if you don't take it with food. And you have to get EKG's baseline on all of these, but Geodon can cause some abnormalities in the EKG that definitely have to be addressed. The only way you address them is by stopping the Geodon or going down on the dose but they have to be addressed. Any of these antipsychotics can cause EKG changes, so you do have to get a baseline. Uh, Abilify, now we're looking at the newer meds. Abilify is, of these antipsychotics, theoretically, Abilify causes the least appetite increase, right? The least uh, potential metabolic syndrome, or less risk, there's still a risk, as well as, um, um, EPS or tyrodive dyskinesia, okay? That being said, if your child has those side effects, and that's what's important, it's your child, so who cares what statistics are? So you still have to look out for that, okay? Some of these medications, there's another symptom called akathisia. You give the, the children or you give the patient these medications to help kind of slow them down, decrease the agitation. Akathisia is severe restlessness they feel like they're gonna crawl out of their skin. Abilify has to be started at a really low dose or else it will give you akathisia. And then you're just gonna see a kiddo that runs around all over the place and they're really just really bothered, which makes them irritable, right? And so you think the medication's getting them worse. It's really not the medication directly that's making, affecting their mood. It's just that they're really just uncomfortable with this bodily feeling that they have that they're crawling out of their skin. So that's another thing you have to watch out for with these medications. In kids, you always start really low, okay? Because if you add a side effect, it's not gonna be the medication. It's not gonna be the medication for that child necessarily. So you want it to be the, the, the least uncomfortable as possible, so you start low, okay? And then you go from there.